The canon conundrum is an argument against sola scriptura that is popular in Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic circles. The argument can briefly be summarized as a question. If scripture is the sole infallible authority, then how can one know what scripture is? Those putting this argument forth will say that scripture does not give us a canon list, so the Christian has to rely on an external authority to know what scripture is. According to this argument, the Bible is posterior to the church both in itself, as the church creates the Bible, and for the Christian, as the Christian depends on the church to tell them what the scriptures are. They say that apart from an infallible church, we can only use fallible means to reach scripture, so we cannot truly trust scripture as reliable because we may be wrong about scripture in itself. The infallibility of the church saves the Christian from this problem at the expense of sola scriptura. Put another way, the Roman Catholic or Orthodox will say that scripture is known through tradition. If the canon is authoritative, then tradition is authoritative, and thus sola scriptura is forfeited. On the other hand, if the canon is not authoritative, then the canon is not determinable. And so there's no way to actually uphold sola scriptura. This argument has been around for a while and it's been used by a variety of individuals in a variety of ways. Robert Bellarmine waged this argument against the Protestants, as did his contemporaries. It's still a common argument from Roman Catholics, and I've personally seen it become more popular in the Orthodox spheres as well. This argument troubled me when I was first investigating various traditions. How could I know what the Bible was? Was I relying on the church to tell me what scripture is? Does scripture receive its authority from the church, such that I need to convert to whichever church can lay claim to the canonization process? There are several ways to respond to this argument. First, there is the denial that this is an issue. The Pharisees could have waged this exact argument on Christ, but Christ wouldn't care. Christ rebukes the Pharisees for their traditions in Matthew 15 and Mark 7, and they could have said to him that he relies on them and their traditions for knowing what the Old Testament scriptures are. Therefore, the Jewish Sanhedrin is prior to the scriptures and he must submit to their rule. Of course, we don't see them do this, but if they said this, we all know that Christ would not suddenly ignore what he said about the traditions of men. Christ would not say, well, you're correct, and I must retract my statements on tradition because I realize that I am relying on tradition to know what the scriptures are, both in terms of the canon and in terms of the interpretation. Therefore, this argument wouldn't really mean anything. So if the scripture is given to us by the church, but the church disobeys the scriptures, we still have a right to rebuke the church for her false doctrines. Giving the scriptures does not entail the infallibility of tradition. Therefore, we do not need to submit to the church because she gives us the scriptures. I've heard some ask, quote, are you God, unquote, as though imitating Christ in this way would make us prideful and take God's place. This misses the point of the passage. Christ does not establish new teachings that contradict previous teachings, but says that the traditions, even if they supposedly come from Moses, do not need to be followed if they are outside of Scripture. Note that these traditions don't contradict Scripture, but simply add to it. According to Martin Chemnitz, the Pharisees also claimed that their traditions were infallible because they could be traced back to Moses via a kind of Old Testament apostolic succession, wherein Moses is substituted as an apostle. Therefore, we see great similarities between the Romanists, Orthodox, and the Pharisees in this regard. A Goy for Jesus, a channel that I highly recommend, has a great video explaining the psychology of converts to Roman Catholicism. Of course, this does not explain all converts to Rome, but many convert because of this argument. I almost did. He argues that converts to Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy who are persuaded by this argument seek epistemic certainty where we're not necessarily promised it. They go down a rabbit hole of skepticism and are pulled out by relying on an external authority, giving them a sense of security and certainty. So much for Protestantism, leading to secularism, when in fact it's Romanist apologists that use the skepticism in the vein of Descartes. However, the church can't provide this. Saying that the church defines the canon doesn't fix the problem, it simply pushes the problem a step back. How do you know that the church is authoritative? Is it because she tells you? Some may say that scripture promises this in Matthew 16, where it's said that Peter receives the keys and the gates of Hades will not prevail over the church. Leaving aside the exegetical difficulties with such a view that the keys guarantee infallibility, we can respond that this is circular. They could also say that tradition entails such, but that's question begging. Tradition tells you that tradition is infallible. Bellarmine will come along and say that tradition is self-attesting, just as the Protestants historically say that scripture is self-attesting, and so we're at a kind of impasse. If tradition is self-attesting and tradition establishes the canon, then we return to the problem of Matthew 15 and Mark 7, wherein Christ says the opposite about the traditions of men. They could respond that those are the traditions of the Pharisees, but the traditions of the church are reliable and true. But again, this is question-begging. Further, we reach the problem of determining what the church is in the first place. How do you know that you're in the true church? Is it because the church tells you which fathers to read? 
If so, then you haven't solved the problem. They may be able to cite early church fathers for supporting their views, but at that point, they could just be telling you where to look when these fathers are actually wrong. As Colin Brooks points out, the Mormons interpret history too. They argue that there was a great apostasy. How do they know that this didn't happen? I don't actually believe that this is the case, but in the spirit of skepticism, we have to ask how the Christian knows which fathers to follow to determine what the church is. To determine what the church is, you listen to the church to tell you who to read. Again, this is circular. Is it because of some other option that secular historians tell you which fathers have historically been recognized as the church fathers? In that case, this may be an objective option, but you lose the infallibility of it and thus are left with the skepticism that's lobbed at Protestants, except now it's directed at the notion of tradition and the fathers. I want to reiterate that I'm not on this trail of skepticism myself. I don't believe the church has lied to us about who the fathers are, but I'm engaging in the same skepticism that our opponents use against us. The point is that they don't solve their own problems. They say that they know the truth of scripture by knowing what the church says about scripture, but we can simply ask how they know what the church is. They push the problem back a step. To summarize this point, they say that we need an infallible authority to connect us to the scriptures because otherwise there is no sure infallibility to determine the scriptures. They struggle with the same problem, but instead they have to determine what the true church is. They say that we need something infallible for us to know what the scriptures are, but they don't need something infallible to tell them what the church is. This goes on ad infinitum, so they are also subject to their own fallible minds at some point. Similarly, they say that we need something infallible to give us scripture. We cannot rely on fallible men to give us an infallible set of documents, but they are inconsistent on this too. Do they not rely on fallible translations of infallible documents? Think of councils that are translated or copied. Were the scribes and translators infallible? We can see similar patterns with their arguments for the formal insufficiency of scripture, but I won't delve too far into that matter. Suffice it to say that their argument is that you need an infallible interpreter to understand the scriptures, therefore you need the church. They believe that there is a disconnect between the fallible human mind and the infallible scriptures, so you need an infallible connector. This leads us to wonder what infallible authority they have that lets them perfectly understand church statements, as though the church councils and other ecclesiastical documents are infinitely more perspicuous than what God has written in the scriptures. But returning to the topic at hand, I think this question is asked in a dishonest way because what they want is not actually possible to give. Michael Kruger points out that even if God did give some list of the biblical canon, our opponents would ask how we know that said table of contents is authoritative. This would go ad infinitum. According to Kruger, the Roman Catholic model, which is somewhat similar to the model I see from online orthodox, is not satisfactory because it ignores the possibility of scripture self-authentication. The question is asked in a dishonest way, saying that Protestants can only defend the existence of such a canon on the basis of an inspired table of contents. But if we were actually able to provide such a table of contents, they would scoff and ask the same question again, this time containing the table of contents alongside the scriptures. And on the other hand, they simply ignore the possibility of scripture authenticating itself. They seem to simply forget that scripture makes verifiable claims about the world, about history. So if those claims are true, there's further evidence for scripture being true. We can look at internal and external evidence of scripture being true. We do not need to treat scripture as neutral in terms of truth, only then to be illuminated by the church as she decides what is and isn't canon. In effect, these apologists hold a view of the Bible wherein the inspiration of scripture is external to the text. That inspiration is undiscoverable in itself. We categorically reject this notion. This is the crux of the argument. They say that we need an infallible table of contents to know what the Bible is, but we say that we do not need an infallible table of contents because the scriptures are intelligibly known as infallible in themselves, though with significant study, of course. Colin Brooks, a man whose videos I thoroughly recommend, says the same regarding the self-authenticating model. Building off Michael Kruger's work, there are several different models of canonicity. Specifically, there are community-determined models, which include the historical critical model, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox models, and the canonical criticism model, alongside the existential neo-Orthodox model. There are historically determined models, including the canon within the canon model and the criteria of canonicity model. Finally, there is the Protestant view that scripture is self-authenticating. Usually, our interlocutors conveniently ignore almost every model that I just mentioned, saying that there is really only the Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox model which is only one option within the community determined models in themselves. In this respect, they are not actually engaging with the scholarly debates whatsoever, showing that they're apologists first, not actual scholars or historians. They're fundamentally ignoring several different models, then try to shove the Protestant model into their own model. This is either ignorant or intellectually dishonest. This would not be the case, of course, if they actually spent time showing that their model is superior to the other models present, but I haven't seen that, at least from those who typically parrot this argument. Colin Brooks also points out that this question is often asked in a way that's question-begging. It's not always this way, but I often encounter it. 
they say, quote, what authority do you have to determine what scripture is, end quote, which is precisely what they're trying to prove. The Protestant says that the Eastern Orthodox Roman Catholic model has the burden of proof on this, that they need to show that we need scripture and some other authority to be infallible. And they ask, what infallible entity do you have other than scripture to show that scripture is infallible? This is precisely what we're asking them to prove. There are several different forms of the argument that are not actually question begging. If formed in a way to simply say, quote, we would expect scripture to give us a definitive and exhaustive list of scriptures, but it doesn't, therefore it requires some external authority, end quote, then it's not question begging. I want to focus on that better form of the argument for now. So how do we answer the question directly? Well, it appears that we can look for a variety of factors. We can look at authorship alongside internal consistency and harmony, and finally, external self-attestation, testing the claims of these words to what is known to be true. Of course, there are other criteria that are apparently within some of the Lutheran fathers, um, but that's going to get really off into the weeds, and I think for simplicity's sake, we can use these as the primary determining factors. What's important is that scripture has its own ontological status. It's unique. It's said in 2 Timothy 3.16 that scripture is, quote, God-breathed, end quote, which indicates that it receives its authority from God himself, not from the canonization process. Such is repeated in 2 Peter 1.21, quote, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, end quote. This doesn't make the epistemology any easier, but we can at least say that we need not say that scripture is ontologically posterior to any ecclesiastical institutions. Of course, we recognize that the authors of scripture were members of the church, but that doesn't entail that we need the church to corporately determine the canon for us, such that canonicity is extrinsic to the Bible. To summarize this point, saying that Paul and Peter were part of the church before scripture, such that scripture comes from the church, is not the same as saying that we need an infallible magisterium or infallible set of oral traditions to give us scripture. That doesn't logically follow. When I ask our opponents when they think that scripture was declared canon, they typically say something like the 4th century, which is pretty much the same view as a lot of liberal scholars today. But the early church fathers don't speak this way. The early church fathers write as though scripture is canon in itself, not something they have to define, something they receive. For example, when Irenaeus describes Revelation, he clearly believes that the four creatures before the throne are the four gospels. He sees scripture as infallible and attacks the various Gnostic sects for mutilating them or twisting them. He doesn't act like he's operating on what he thinks should be canon, but instead treats these books as the very word of God. Theophilus of Antioch spends time in his letter to Autolycus, roughly around 177 AD, showing that the New Testament has the same authority and integrity as the Old Testament. In Book 3, Chapter 12, Theophilus says that the Gospels are just as infallible as the Old Testament writings, specifically the writings of the prophets. He cites Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Zechariah, and Proverbs, then cites Matthew a few times and says that John is inspired. He also appears to cite Luke, but it doesn't seem that he cites Mark anywhere that we know of. According to St. Jerome, however, Theophilus did write a harmony of the four Gospels. According to Robert M. Grant, there is a significant amount of Pauline phrases in Theophilus' writings, so it appears that he was well aware of Pauline texts, too. Nowhere in this treatise do we see Theophilus tell Autolycus that they affirm the New Testament alongside the Old because the Church says that they should. Instead, he simply shows the harmony of the Old Testament and the New. We wouldn't expect this if the view of our opponents were the clear and obvious case. When responding to the heretic Marcion, Tertullian writes, quote, We lay it down as our first position, that the Evangelical Testament has apostles for its authors, to whom was assigned by the Lord himself this office of publishing the gospel, end quote. That's from Against Marcion, Book 4, Chapter 2. This indicates that Tertullian sees the apostolic office as an authenticating factor of canonical authority, and so we should expect that a writing by an apostle would be considered canon. Some may say, quote, you need tradition to defend this, therefore you rely on tradition. But this is a confusion of tradition and evidence. We don't take those statements from the fathers solely to be traditions, but to be pieces of evidence that testified to the canonical authority of certain writings. Eusebius, in Church History, Book 6, Chapter 12, states that Serapion rejected a certain gospel of Peter because it was not written by Peter. Eusebius writes that the church receives Peter and the other apostles as they receive Christ, but they don't receive writings falsely attributed to them. And so we can see that Serapion and the church rejected works that were falsely attributed to apostles. So apostolic authority is a very important aspect of a book's canonical status. Even if it doesn't establish the positive that scripture is determined by apostolic authority, we notice that these figures don't say that the church establishes such scriptures or creates them, but recognizes them. They receive Peter as they receive Christ. They don't arbitrarily define the writings as the authority of Christ. This is seen elsewhere in Eusebius, specifically Church History, Book 3, Chapters 3 and 25. 
where he says that some books are received as canonical because they're written by the apostles, but others are rejected because they're not written by apostles, or at least they're questionable. He admits that there are differing opinions on certain books like Revelation, Jude, James, 2nd and 3rd John, and 2nd Peter. As a quick aside, notice that Luther's harsh words against James at one point in his life are not without precedent, but actually go back to the early church. I'll admit that Eusebius does appeal to earlier writers for the distinction between canonical, disputed, and heretical books. However, that doesn't indicate that he was relying on some tradition, such that he was dependent on the church for knowing the scriptures, as though the church holds some kind of infallibility in this matter. But simply, this is evidence, not tradition. The Roman church even admits that scripture is not defined by the church, but is received. Such is found in Vatican I, where it is said, quote, These books the church holds to be sacred and canonical, not because she subsequently approved them by her authority after they had been composed by unaided human skill, nor simply because they contain revelation without error, but because, being written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author, and were as such committed to the church, end quote. Of course, this doesn't address any Eastern opposition, but popular Roman apologists say this, so they stand in opposition to the First Vatican Council. To be fair to them, this was an opinion in the Counter-Reformation. Chemnitz cites Pigius as saying, quote, The Church has this power, that she can impart to certain writings a canonical authority which they do not have of themselves or from their authors, end quote, speaking of the scriptures. This seems to be the view of many modern apologists, both from Rome and the East, that the Church is ontologically prior to Scripture and so the Church can define canon as they see fit. Even if this is not the position, but that instead Scripture is determined on its own account, but the Church is needed to relay such information, then we can't help but make an analogy between a doctor who relays diagnostic information to the patient. The doctor can err in other areas of life, but their ability to diagnose and relay that information may be good. So it's not as though the doctor has authority insofar as he is himself, but that the doctor has authority because of the study and resources he has. And again, the apologist runs into the same problem, but instead of determining what the scriptures are, they must also determine what the church is and what the scriptures are. We can appeal even to the Old Testament for this as well. The Jews didn't have some infallible institutions such that they were able to understand which writings were of God on their own. I know that Swan Sana has spent time trying to show that the Sanhedrin was infallible, but I don't think this is tenable. The other, Paul and Agui for Jesus, have done some good work on this, but suffice it to say that Swan is using pharisaical sources to interpret the Old Testament scriptures, which is certainly questionable, and he follows an interpretation of Matthew 23 that not even George Leo Haydock would endorse regarding the following of the statements of the Pharisees. Jesus corrected the behavior and teaching of the Pharisees several times, including their oral traditions, which Jesus said were false. Point is, our opponents need a really wacky understanding of the Old Testament church if they want to hold to this model of canonicity. On top of all of this, our interlocutors have a very low view of Scripture. They look at Scripture as practically unintelligible in itself, specifically with their arguments denying Scripture's formal sufficiency, and they say in this argument that Scripture is not powerful enough to be recognized in itself. God cannot or has not written something that shows his signature, so to speak. This is precisely what Pigius, the How to Be Christian YouTube channel, and others say. In a How to Be Christian's own video, he says that the difference between a random set of children's books, specifically by Dr. Seuss he's holding, and his Bible is that the church has declared that the Bible is to be infallible. This is a really low view of scripture, an insulting view in fact. This is not the view that the fathers, as mentioned before, hold to. And so, returning to the psychology of converts, I think a goy for Jesus is correct in his primary argument. Though he primarily speaks of converts to Rome, I think the same holds for the East too. Many converts are convinced by this argument, and they seek absolute certainty and intellectual rest. Again, not all converts, but the ones that are convinced by this argument, they want epistemic certainty where it's not promised. They want to simply be told what to believe without actually looking into the questions. But I don't think that God promises this, nor do I think the church can fulfill this. Examining Rome, look at all the debates they're having regarding the nature of Vatican II and what it entails. Is it merely a pastoral council? Is it infallible? Do the church err such that there's no pope anymore? As I'm writing this, there's a debate going on between classical theist and Michael Wolfton on the nature of the magisterium and the possibility of error in statements made ex cathedra. These converts are told that you get to escape the uncertainty and difficulty of interpreting scripture because now you have an infallible authority who can just tell you what scripture means. But then when you enter Rome, you have to debate the nature of infallibility and the office that is supposedly infallible. And if you do find a pope like Honorius, who was clearly a heretic, he actually wasn't a pope, though he held office that seemed to be papal. How does this make anything easier or clearer for the convert? It's sad because these converts then have to live in denial about where they are. They can't simply accept that the church is not going to give them the answers to everything in a way that's clearer than scripture. Yet they still parrot this talking point that you are left in utter skepticism and subjectivism without the guide of the church. 
You have to understand a greater quantity of documents and you have to debate which documents are actually authoritative in certain ways. And you have to see if those documents are themselves formally sufficient in the first place. It has to be so confusing for anybody who follows Francis and all that he does while trying to hold to traditional views of papal authority. The nuancing of people like Michael Lofton and Catholic Answers should honestly show you just how difficult it is to truly hold to this view, the view that the church is the source of intelligibility. I mention all this not because every convert is this way, but the converts who usually parrot the canon conundrum argument are blissfully unaware, or at least in denial, of their own inconsistency, their own sad situation. I hope you all enjoyed the arguments set forth, and I'd like to make a few acknowledgments because these arguments aren't all my own. I drew heavily from Martin Chemnitz's Examination of the Council of Trent, Volume 1, Johann Gerhard's On the Nature of Theology and Scripture, Michael Kruger's The Question of Canon, William Whitaker's Disputation on Holy Scripture, some videos and tweets by Agoy for Jesus and the other Paul, and various articles from Tria Blog, Michael Kruger, and Turrets and Fan. I should also mention that Seth, the other owner of this channel, wrote a blog on this topic with an argument that's pretty interesting, uh, something I haven't personally seen elsewhere, and even if it does exist, it's definitely not a popular one. I would try to summarize it in this video, but I think it's far easier to read in the blog post as opposed to reading it out loud here. You may need to go back and spend a lot of time contemplating it because it's highly metaphysical. Well, with that all being said, thanks. Uh, let me know your thoughts if you have anything else to say on this topic, and I hope this blessed you. Have a good day.